Between 1923 and 1926, for the masses in three villages, they were subjected to not only communism, but after the establishment of the Soviet Union, another terror arrived in far eastern Siberia. What rogue creature hunted the villagers for a period of almost three years? How did they stop it? And did the killings ever return? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author. And we've answered these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. During the onset of the cold Siberian winter in October 1923, the first killings took place and lasted until April 1924 when the snows began to thaw. People were killed while working outside and even a few were killed in their homes. Over the next two winters, over 30 people would be killed in total. The Kamchatka Peninsula is home to the largest feline predators on earth, the Amur or Siberian tiger. They once roamed all over Central and Northern Asia, and today they are still sometimes seen in Northern China and Manchuria. According to world-renowned expert Dr. Victor Yudin, such an animal must have weighed in at over 800 pounds, making it one of the largest tigers to have ever lived. The tiger was determined to be a male, due to the extraordinary large 8-inch diameter paw prints it left in the deep snow. The hunters, who knew the terrain, found it a very clever and elusive creature and determined to possibly have a damaged right front leg due to the uneven depth of the impressions and its prints, as well as the uneven gait. Injured tigers that were unable to hunt their normal prey, such as boar and deer, have often found humans an easier target. However, oddly enough, during the short warm months of May through August, there were no attacks in either year. That lured the population into a false sense of security. As the snow fell in the winter of 1924 through 1925, there were more deaths and disappearances of people as the tigers seemed to roam the region, hitting each of the three outlying villages at random, where the many farms were scattered and neighbors were few. Given the wide expanse of the heavily forested areas, where a few people lived in close proximity to each other, often several miles away, it was a natural hunting ground. During this time, the local communist leadership knew that they had a big problem and they needed help. But sending bad news to Moscow was not looked upon with great interest. Local administrators who could not handle their own oblast or district for any reason often fell afoul of their masters in the Kremlin. And after Vladimir Lenin died and Joseph Stalin took over the country, apprehension at sending bad news only increased. Hoping to handle the situation themselves, they authorized weapons to be issued to select men who were to track and kill the tiger, which lasted all that winter. But the tiger was never caught and the attacks continued. The tiger had imprinted upon one young villager it attacked, who survived, remembering his scent and tasting his blood. The young man had also apparently wounded the tiger, but it ran away as more hunters ran to the scene. The hunting parties were still sent out, but even the hunters were being killed, and the mayor had no choice but to reach out for help. The closest military installation was in Vladivostok, on the Pacific coast, so a request was sent. This was not simply a request to help the various villagers. There was a hard coal mine used for the steel industry that was also under threat, and workers had apparently been killed, and any reduction in coal production meant trouble. The request was received, and a Red Army company comprised of soldiers and Marines were tasked to locate and kill the rogue man-eater. But it took them almost two weeks to arrive by rail and then over land. The Red Army also used an aircraft to try and spot the tiger, but without success, and a tiger was later killed. However, it was determined by the hunters not to be the man-eater due to the paws being too small. However, the local communist officials disregarded this assumption. They needed a victory. Complacency once again set in, as many people believed that the rogue tiger had been killed. Unfortunately, they were wrong. The last killings took place during the winter of 1925 through the beginning 
spring of 1926. By the spring of 1926, at least 34 people were known to have been killed, but another two dozen or more people had disappeared without a trace. Then, as mysteriously as the killings began, they stopped. The tiger never returned. Did the tiger die or just move on to a safer killing ground due to the massive hunts? This is hard to determine as no predator would normally leave such a target-rich environment. With the heavily forested mountainous regions, freshwater lakes and rivers, the tiger was in a perfect location, especially with human prey in the area. Over the decades, this story went from being a minor report and little-known historical narrative, a cautionary tale, if you like, into one of persistent local folklore. Even today in these small villages, mothers sometimes tell their children the story, passed down through several generations. They tell them that if the children are not good, the devil, meaning the tiger, will come for them. So they had better be on their best behavior. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe for free. And please stay tuned and be engaged and informed. Send us comments if you have questions or even show ideas. And we will respond to all requests and comments as soon as we can. Thank you.